Back into action. We're going to have a go. Start with you. What is it? Yeah? Anybody can add to that? Okay. What is it? Is it a, a data structure? Okay. It's a mechanism. Yes. That, that's used. It's a locking mechanism that's used to maybe synchronize processes in using a, a critical section. Right. What values does it resume or assume? The, uh, the actual numerical value that it gets. A semaphore. What, what values does it have normally? What value do you initialize? Is it initialized to? Any idea? The maximum number of users or that are allowed to use the resource or the critical section. Okay, and what's the lowest number it could assume? What's the smallest value? Are you sure? It's not minus one? Is it a minus one or is it a zero? What's the lowest number? Zero. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's why they, it's defined as a non-negative integer. It's a non-negative integer. It's a zero or, or, or higher. And what's a binary semaphore? A binary semaphore? Hold on, I have volunteers here, yeah? It's a semaphore which only uses, allows one user into a critical section. And therefore, it assumes the value zero or one. It can only assume the value zero or one. <clears throat> and what advantages does a semaphore have? Any advantages? Over the other techniques. It, it eliminates starvation, so no process will starve from using the critical section. Anything else? It doesn't have a limitation. A lim it, it can have any number of users that can go into the critical section simultaneously. And it eliminates the busy weight. So how does it eliminate the starvation? When we say no starvation, how does it do that? How does it get rid of starvation? By uh, sending to a queue. By, queue. by using a queue, by placing the waiting processes in a queue, not just waiting randomly. And therefore, the first in the queue will be released first, right? What about the, um, what's the other one? Done. What's the other one? All right. No, the other advantage I meant that the, it eliminates. It eliminates starvation and it eliminates. Okay. Right. I'm going to jump to something else. Right. What's what's the p function in a semaphore? What does the p function do? Well, what is it, and when is it called? into action. It's a wait function. It could make a process wait. When, when is it called? The, before, uh, before, the before the critical section. And what does it do? Check, uh, check, uh, Any idea? Yeah. Okay. It checks if the critical section is busy. If it's absolutely busy, it will go into a wait. If not, it will decrement that value and go in. Decrement the, the semaphore variable. What about the V function? When does it get called and what does it do? When the process leaves the critical section. 
And what does it do? What's the main function of the V function? What's the main purpose for the V function? It will signal any waiting processes. What if there are no waiting processes? What does it do? It, it will increment the variable, the semaphore variable, and continue. Okay? You need to be very clear with semaphore and with the test and set and the wait and signal. Those three mechanisms, you should be pretty comfortable with them. Right. What I'm going to talk about today is another manager. We're finished with the process management. So today we talk about device management. Okay, devices and device management. Anybody before talking about it, anybody knows what the function of a device management is? or the device manager? To manage the I.O. resources. To manage the I.O. resources. When we say it manages them, what, what does it do to them? Allocate those resources. So it's just like any other manager. If you know what a memory manager does, what does a memory manager do? Allocates memory and deallocates memory and keep track of memory. And, and same as with the device manager. It allocates devices, deallocates devices from a process when a process finishes with them. And it keeps track of all devices at all times. It needs to know each device, what status it's in. Is it busy or is it free? And if it's busy, who is using it? That kind of thing. So that's basically what the main function of a device um, manager does. So we'll talk about devices today and more specifically we'll concentrate on the storage devices. Um, and we'll talk about the hard disk, the tapes, you know, briefly just going through those uh, devices or and we try and work out what the strategies for using those devices such a, an efficient way, most efficient way of using those devices. So devices in general, that's any, any equipment or piece of machinery that's connected to the, to the computer that's normally used by other applications or, or processes, including printers, including the mouse, the scanners, any other devices. And generally, devices can be classified into many different ways. So one way that they can be classified is, are they being shared or dedicated? So we can say, oh, there's two groups of devices, either dedicated or shared. There's another group, a virtual device. Everybody knows what a virtual device is? Do you know what a virtual device is? It's a dedicated device, but uh, it's not the use of a software. Yeah, so it's a device that by its nature is a dedicated device, but we manage to share it somehow or make it appear as if it's shareable. So that's one way we can classify devices. We can say this device is shared or dedicated or virtual. Other ways that we can classify devices, or storage devices in particular, like um, whether they are sequential or... So a device can be a sequential device where information of that device has to be read in sequence as in the case of tapes where you must read it in, from a particular point. You can't randomly jump to any point you want. If you need to get some information at that tape, then you have to keep reading it until you reach that point sequentially. Or if the device is a, a direct access and storage device, DASD, 
known as a direct access storage device. A direct access storage device is a device which you can reach any point of it, wherever, if there's any file or any piece of data that's stored in any location in that file or in that device, then we can access it directly. So they are known as direct access storage devices. So all devices may be also classified as being um, sequential or direct access. And just talking briefly about those sequential or, or direct access, if you have a direct access device, you can reach any point you want directly. If you want to update a file, you can go straight to that file or that particular record and modify it. And therefore, this would be suitable for applications that require quick um, interaction with the user. So if, if you need a quick response time, if you want some information, you can go straight, get the information, and present it to the user. So it has quite short response time if you are using the direct access device. If we are using a device such as a tape, for example, that you need to start reading, if you need that piece of data, you you have to keep going through the entire tape until you reach that piece of information. That does, that does not go well with um, ab applications that require, or that are interactive applications that require a short response time. Um, historically, the tapes have been around for a long time. They've been around well, since the 50s, or, um, and they were around before computers were, were in use, but as computers came, tapes were a very good form of, of storing information. Even though they started with paper first, but they soon switched to, to magnetic tapes. So tapes are, are, are a wonderful way of storing information, but they had this problem of being sequential and being slow. And soon after that, in the 60s and 70s, the 70s, they started producing those disk drives that allowed direct access to every location. And they can store a pretty good amount of information as well. And you'd think by now, the tapes would be out of action. They're so old, they're so slow, they, we can't use them for interactive applications. But they're still around. They're probably still, there are more tapes in use today in storing information than there are hard disks and other forms of storage devices. Any idea why? Any guess? Why are we still using tapes? Why are there so many tapes still in use around the world? Pardon? Archiving is just storing lots and lots of data you don't need to access again very often. Yeah, well, okay, yeah. So it's, it's the ability to store a lot of information, even though we can still store a good bit of information on hard disks, but tapes, they can store a lot more. And a lot more cheaper as well. If you consider the amount of data you can store on a hard disk or on a tape, tapes are way cheaper. And even though they are not suitable for interactive applications, but they are suitable for other applications, such as backup operations. So almost almost every organization, every big data user around the world, banks, organizations, insurance companies, hospitals, most likely at night they use tapes to store or do backup of their information. The other point is that they can carry a lot of information, huge amount of information. Right? You won't be able to access them, you know, on seconds or minutes, but at least if you need it, it's there and you can do a backup or um, recall it again if it's required. Probably 99% of it is never needed, or 99.9 .9 is not required. But if you need it, at least you know it's there. So that's, that's still in use, despite the fact that it's been so old and so <coughs> slow and not suitable for interactive operation, but they're still in use in a big way because, because their ability to hold huge amount of information at a fraction of the cost 
of, of hard disks. So they're used for backup operations and other operations that are, don't, does not require interaction with the user. Now, mind you, they're, they're all known as magnetic uh, storage devices. So you actually introduce a magnetic charge into a surface or an area that's, uh, that can be magnetized. So that the tape or the hard disk are impregnated with material that can be magnetized. And the way um, information is wrote onto it is by actually having a magnetic field that gets generated by the data based on the data that we are going to store. And that generates a magnetic field that aligns the surface of the tape or the hard disk as well, because the surface, the metal hard part of the hard disk, if we're looking vertically at the hard disk, or looking at it, say, from this point where the head as well is, is magnetically, um, generates a magnetic field to align some of the data that's there or the magnetic material based, again, on the information that that's passed. <clears throat> so it's basically what we do is we generate a magnetic charge and align those ma the material there in a certain way that we can also pick it up. If we need to pick it up, this also will affect the, the, the reading head and will cause a, gen a magnetic field to be generated if we need to generate it. We should be able to regenerate it. So information is stored using the, this magnetic charge put onto the hard disk or the tape. But they have a slight disadvantage that with time, this magnetic charge kind of dissipates slowly and gets weaker and weaker. It takes like time of around 15 years or so. Um, so even though they are long-term storage devices, but if you have a videotape that uses the same facility and if it's any longer than 15 or 20 years, you, you start noticing that the quality starts going bad. Um, so, and that's prob the problem with most magnetically charged uh, storage devices. But looking at it, and we'll, we'll consider then the, the optical storage devices that are in the form of CDs and DVDs and other devices that use um, <clears throat> information, store information in the form of, of light or change in the surface, looking at the surface, so if we're looking at the hard, the CD now, just horizontally, if we twist it around and look at it, the surface of the, of the CD is actually, the information is stored in a different way. We use a laser beam, and on, on CDs anyway, and DVDs, a laser beam is used that burns, actually burns, heats the surface the surface has sensitive material that can get burned based on the, again, on the information that we need to store, the binary from memory um, that affects the light. And as the hard disk or the CD, sorry, rotates, um, we, we, we write on kind of tracks, spiral tracks here. I'll mention them now in a second. So you can actually, as you burn it, it kind of generates a little trough or a little bottom there and, and a top and based this kind based on the ones and zeros you can end up having um, the surface physically altered and to read it we use the less intense light that comes on and as it's reflected it's picked up here based on the surface the reflection of the surface and we can translate that into ones and zeros and it should be the same material that was burnt we'd be able to regenerate it by actually reading from, <clears throat> by reflection, the reflection of, of a lesser kind of intense light. <coughs> and some, so basically there's no magnetic field involved here. There are other devices later on that were introduced, there were magneto that uses light or laser and magnet to, to but we'll, we'll get to it in a sec. Um, but basically, initially, the optical devices actually used light to burn or itch the surface of that device and then 
by reading it is actually by shining a light again onto it and check the reflection of that light. Considering that, then there's, there's no magnetic field involved in, in this particular one. And they claim that any data put onto it, it will last forever. And because theoretically, yes, it should last forever unless, you know, somebody breaks it or physically changes it. But um, in fact, they realized after a while that the actual metals that are, that are made, that CDs, the surface is made of, they started causing corrosion after like 15 or 20 years. So they're working on improving those kind of material as well. So even though it doesn't dissipate like magnetic material, but the actual the deterioration of the actual metal itself that could cause a problem. But whenever we store information on a hard disk, it's, it's actually stored on what's known as tracks. So the tracks are just circles concentrated circles, a full circle, one inside the other. And usually the hard disk rotates at relatively high speed. Anybody knows what the speed that hard disks rotate at? Oh, yeah, okay, so pretty high speed, 7,200 RPM revolution per minute. And as we move the head close, so whatever, whatever position we have the head in, it will cover one of the tracks. And the head that moves in, it, it's kind of a, a it's, they use a, what's known as a stepper motor, a stepper motor that can go to one particular track. It, ordinary motors, as they move and you stop them, they kind of tend to take a little, slow a little bit and then stop somewhere. You're not very clear where they're going to stop, but with the stepper motor, you can actually stop it at certain points, uh, very precise, and the, the, the technology improved that they can actually have them stop in a fairly close point, and each one of those points, as it stops there and disc rotate, that forms a track. And tracks are numbered, generally, from the outside track to the inside track. Usually, the most outside track is number zero, then the next one is one, two, three, and the maximum, whatever the maximum is, could be 400, 600, or, or so on, in, on the inside tracks. So you can, information can be written in any of those tracks. And whatever, the total amount of information you can write on this track is the same amount of information you can write on the outside track. So it's, on the inside track, it's a little bit more condensed together, while it's more spaced out on the outside track. Also, the, t the tracks are divided into certain areas or certain lengths, and they're known as sectors or blocks, but refer them to them as sectors now. So that's a sector there from here to there. Many books draw it as this is the sector and Many students think this is the sector. That's not the sector. The sector is that or that or that from those areas. So the distance from this point to that point is a sector or from that point to that point is a sector. Not the whole triangle there. That's not the sector. But that's a group of sectors So that have the same number. And these sectors, each sector here is numbered. They're numbered from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And any, anything stored in a file now can be located by or identified. The location for anything stored onto the device is determined by the track number. Let's say track number 76, sector number 3. So that means you go to track number 76 and that, the file is stored this here on this sector, for example. So you need at least those two pieces of information. And as you can see, the amount of information you stored on this sector is the same amount of information that can be stored onto this sector. It's just going to be a little bit spaced out on that sector. And just to get a little bit further on this one, with operating systems, they only deal an operating system whenever it's asked to read a record. Each time it comes to read a record, first it has to start the hard disk rotating, reaching that speed. And then 
it has the mechanism for the head, it moves the head to the correct track, let's say this track 76 here, and then if it needs to read that piece of information, obviously this is spinning so fast, so it might have just missed it now, so it has to wait until this track or this sector comes right underneath the head that can pick it up, pick, pick that information up. So there are actually three kind of movements or mechanisms that are required. The rotation, moving the head to the correct track, um, and waiting for this correct sector to come underneath the head, and then actually picking the information up. And the total of this is known as access time for the hard disk. And usually every hard disk, it's stamped onto it how much is, the, how much is access time. And, and actually the, the hard disks are categorized by how quick the, their access time is, how short it is. Um, so moving the head onto the correct track is known as seek time. So that's the seek time is the time it takes to move the head, to move the head, that slight movement, to move it onto the correct head. It takes a thousand, a few thousandths of a second or a few hundredths of a second, but that's, it's part of actually that, the time delay that takes, that forms the access time. And then after that, once the head is on the correct track, then it has to wait for the, based on the speed here, We'll wait for the correct sector to come under the head, and that's known as rotational speed. And then finally, once the correct sector is under the head, then the information is picked up by through the magnetic, electromagnetic field that affects the head that can translate that into an electric signal, and that's called the, what is it known as? Transfer speed time, or transfer time. So access time is actually made up of those three times together. And some hard disks they actually don't have a seek time. They don't have the head moving. Any hard disk that has a head, a moving head, it's just known as well with that. It can be classified as is this hard disk, is a moving head disk, or is it a fixed head? And if it's a fixed head, some devices they actually, all the sectors that they have, all the tracks that they have, they actually have hard disks or heads, so many heads, one is lined up with each track, and they're all there forever. They're staying there, they're fixed, they don't move. So anytime you want to read data from that, there's no seek time involved. And if this rotates at 7,200 or higher, then you're going to pick it up, it's going to be very short time, and transfer is, is even shorter. So some hard disks, they have what's known as the fixed head. And that fixed head makes those hard disks, it makes them very high, very fast, very short access time, but also very, very expensive. That's not the kind of head you find in your laptop or your desktop at home. These are reserved for, for very expensive, you know, machineries or devices or systems that require a very fast access. Things like spaceships or airplanes or real special devices, maybe military devices. So at the moment, the most of what we have, you and I have, are the ones that have one head, not multiple heads. One head and we move it to on top of the correct, the required track. And that involves that extra delay of seek time. Now, looking at the, okay, there's, there's something called buffering or blocking. I'll talk about it in a second, but just I'm going to look at the optical disk just while we're, we're looking at the hard disk. The format of the optical disk is the way information is, is stored onto, onto the optical disk. They don't, optical disks don't have concentric circles. Information is not stored on concentric circles. They actually on one single continuous track, spirally kind of track that you write the information on. And the information on it, whether you're in the inside or the outside, they, 
it's well compressed. Remember here on the outside track, it's well spaced out on a hard disk, while on a, on a CD, it's compressed here as well, the same as the on, on the inside track. That's why we can store a lot more information. With hard disks, there seem to be a lot of wasted space, especially on the outside tracks. Um, well, while the inside tracks are well packed, but the outside tracks are not. On CDs and DVDs and other devices, they're all pa packed quite well at all different parts of the, of the device. And therefore, we can store a lot more information on those. And also, and therefore, those tra sectors or blocks, they're also equal. They carry the same amount of information. But the same amount of information on the outside track might be there. That takes that distance, takes the same distance on an inside track. So on inside track, it might take this much distance. So that's all one track. And therefore, they're not all lined up. They kind of, they'd be out of line because the inside circles are smaller than the outside circles. And therefore, they don't seem to be lined up, but yet they are equal distance. They have equal distances in length. While on hard disk, they don't have equal distance in length. They have rotational distance, that's to say. They have the same angles, but not the same distance. Here they have equal distances. And therefore, as, as, as the information is being read, it has to pass under the head at the same speed. And therefore, going here, rotational speed has to be equal. Like the, the, the length that goes under the head here in one second or one thousandth of a second has to be the same as th this one here. And therefore, the actual speed of the disk tends to change for when you're on the outside track, reading from the outside or reading from the inside. So it tends to be faster as you're on the, on the outside than um, or it's the other way around. So <clears throat> it slows down here so it will cover the same distance, um, but to the, to the outside distance, right? But overall, it should be the, the distance underneath the head should be the, the same at the same length of time. Right. <clears throat> Now, whether you're reading from a hard disk or from a CD or a tape or whatever, usually it, it will involve a delay, enormous amount of delay compared to the speed of memory, um, main memory that uses electronics moving around, which is very close to the speed of light, or compared to the performance of the CPU. Hard disks are still very, very primitive devices or very slow devices. And in order to improve that, the operating system um, uses buffering, just similar idea to spooling that we used on for printers. So in main memory, for example, if any time you say read a character, let's say open a file and read one character, the operating system never reads one character. What it does, it reads a complete block or the information stored in a sector. So it brings all that, because I might as well, by the time you get this rotating and you move, you move the head across, and the head just go over that, and underneath that space goes under the head in a fraction of a second, it picks all that information, puts it there in main memory. And then it gives you that character that you want. And if you ask for a second character, then it doesn't have to go to that slow hard disk. It already has it in main memory. It gives you the next character next. And if you don't ask for it, if your application does not ask for the next character, okay, well, just, you know, it'll ignore it and it'll discard it. But while it's going to the hard disk, might as well, instead of going to read one character, go read the whole lot. So it's like if you're going to maybe go to town or going somewhere for a shopping, you might as well get the week's supply rather than you go for a bottle of milk and then a piece of bread. You go again for a packet of cigarettes or whatever. So... This is the kind of thing. Whenever the operating system gets asked to read a character from a hard disk, it never reads a character, and it never writes a character. It just reads a block. And if you say, write this character to the hard disk, it will take it into memory and write it. If you say, write another character to the file, keep writing to the file until it has big chunk, one block of data, and then it will write it and go once and write it there. So instead of going 
500 times to the hard disk or 5,000 times, it only goes once. And that improves speed tremendously. And this is known as buffering. So once you open a file and you say read from it, one character, one byte, one record, it reads as much as it can. Usually it reads one complete block and pass you the whatever you need. Um, that's known as buffering. So it, some amount of main memory, a buffer in main memory is allocated for this particular purpose, to improve the performance of hard disk or reduce the effect of the slow hard disks compared with, compared to the CPU. Now, another point to worry about or to consider, see, whenever you're asked to, to format a hard disk, for example, it's up to you. You can change the number of tracks up to a certain maximum, but most likely, um, what's more important is the, the, the sectors. It'll ask you how many sectors do you, do you want. And it's up to you. You can have as many sectors as this one, or you can have less sectors. So once the hard disk is formatted, you can say, all right, I just want few sectors. So basically, you can have big blocks or smaller blocks. And the difference between them, I don't know which one is better. Is it better to format our disks into larger blocks? Or the same hard disk is not going to change the amount of data, the total amount of data storage that you can store. For example, if this is the hard disk, same hard disk, same number of tracks, and you can store the, the amount of data is how much you can put on each track. That doesn't change. You still put place in the same amount. But are you going to have, for this particular disk, you're going to have, for example, eight, maybe sectors, or maybe 16 or 24 or larger number sectors. Which one is better? Anybody has any idea? Okay. Yeah. Any other opinions? That's correct. If you if you want each time you read, you want to read a big chunk of data, then this is a better. The better the blocks, the be, the better the the less. That means the less times you need to go to the hard disk. Any other reason for going for smaller? What about? What's the disadvantage then of having the bigger blocks? Why don't we, everybody, forget about, you know, small blocks here, so I'll go for large blocks. It's, it takes the same amount. Oh, for on the hard disk, it doesn't make any difference because you're storing the same amount of data. Well, yeah, if, let's say you might need some extra memory, but once we provide the memory, then if that's, if that's the only thing, then we provide extra memory, and we always have, everybody has bigger blocks. What's the disadvantage of bigger blocks? Your information, the information you want is uh, divided into different uh, blocks, all right? Yeah, well, it'll be one block here, one big file. For example, here, let's say even maybe two blocks. Let's say we have a file this big, it takes one and a half blocks. This one here, it's the same file, same size. It will go as far as here. So it'll take one, two, three, four and a half blocks, or even more. Maybe say ten and a half blocks. So what's the difference? Maybe I just, maybe I just need uh, uh, the, the piece of information I need is in the smaller part of it, uh, in the smaller section, let's say, on the left. And so then you don't need to go, to, to go for big block to get the information, whereas you can just uh, go for a small uh, block. Well, see, they, they operate, you, you will, I don't know what way, uh, for example, we need to access the file, but when you ask the operating system for your file, it will bring you the file. It's up to you then, as an application, to, how am I, I going to access that file? Am I going to go, you know, go for it sequentially, or do I have a random access? If you have random, you'll be able to go straight for the record, if the record you're looking for is here. Well, that's internally how are we going to access that file. Okay, any, anybody else? Anybody has any other opinion as to which, what are the benefits or, or disadvantages of large or small blocks? 
Right, okay. Yeah, there's the, yeah, absolutely. If we have large files like this one here, or even larger, then in order, for example, it appears even easier if, you, if I say copy this file. How long will it take? How many times do you have to go to the hard disk? Remember, each time you want to read a character or a file, the operating system will read you one block at a time. So in this case here, for example, if you need to copy this file, you need to read one that block there and write it to, for example, you're going to write it here. So we, whatever. So that block is written here. And then the other, we come back, read the next block and write it there. And there it is. And the file is finished. We finished copying the file into two visits to the hard disk or four in this case, but we read this file into two visits. So, and that's what's slow about the operation, is how many times you come to the hard disk and move the head and lo locate the item you want to read and read. But once you come here, the operating system will give you one block. No more, no less. It will always tend to do that. So in this case here, it will take us two visits to read the file and maybe two visits to, to write it. While here, if you need to copy the same file, then you have to come back one, twice, three, four, five times, and then to write it then another five times. So the bigger the file, it's the better it is to read it or write it if you had bigger blocks. You know, that means less visits to the hard disk. If you have a very large file and very small blocks, then you might have to do that operation many times. But look at the other way around. Let's say, <clears throat> You want to create a file. You ask the operating system, you, you have a file, you start typing, writing your report, and you wrote one line or one word, and you say, save this file. How is it going to save it? The operating system, again, will not allocate you one byte or, or ten bytes of a file, but also allocate you a block. So in this case here, it will give you this block, and you've only written one word into that file. So most of the space in there is wasted. And, and if most of your files are very small files, then most of your hard disk is going to be very badly used. Because every, every block, every space, storage space we give you, you only use 10% of it. That's 90% of waste. While if we had smaller blocks or, or sectors, then each time we give you a space, it's not going to be very big anyway. So even if you use a small bit of it, that's going to be minimum amount is wasted. So the smaller the blocks, the better and more efficient use of storage devices. But it will take longer to read or write from especially larger files. If you have a bigger blocks, then it will need less visits to read a file to the hard disk. So it's going to be faster reads and writes. But it could mean bad utilization of storage space. So if you join a company and they happen to be formatting their machines and they're asked to, they, you are asked, we're going to format how big is the sector? How big, <clears throat> what size sector should we have? How would you determine what's the best size? Say again? Yeah? <clears throat> now get the profile of the filing system in how big are the files? What's the average size of files in that organization? If it's a video editing creation company, then they're going to have very large files. That's what videos, you know, normally. Then you go for bigger blocks, because it means they'd be, they have faster operations of copy and writing. And, and even if they do, create a file and they put a video. A video is big anyway. Even if it doesn't fill a block, it's going to fill most of it. So there will be less storage space. But if the organization mostly has lots of small files, large number but of very small files, don't go for the big blocks because if you give a, a big, a small file, you give it, you know, very little, uh, a big complete block is given to a small file, you'll have a lot of wasted space. So it's better to go for much smaller block sizes. 
it will have less wasted operation and we're not going to be you know wasting too much reading because the file is not going to be much bigger than one or two blocks or maybe three blocks at the most because most of the files are small and if only the odd file is large that's okay as well so that's with hard disks um, tapes on the other hand So again, just looking at, at the tape horizontally, but if we look at the surface of the tape itself, um, generally information is written on a tape in tracks. So they'll be unseen again tracks. And those tracks, by the way, on the hard disk, most of the time you can hardly see them, you know, the, the, because you're not really scratching it. You're magnetizing it, so it might leave a shade of, you know, slight shade, but very difficult to recognize. Same with the tapes here. The ta in tapes, information is written again on tracks, but each byte is written across the tape. So normally, tapes would have, like, in order to write information, they write eight tracks. So they write zeros, ones, one, zero, eight of them. And then they have one extra track, and they call that the parity track or parity bit. So the parity is used for error detection. Um, so whenever you write into a tape, normally whenever a tape is being written to, so you take a file, you take one byte, it's written across, take the next byte, it's written across again, it's one, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and so on. And the parity bit is added by the system, not by your file. And the parity bit usually, just for example, the parity bits can be either odd or even. So let's just say we take the odd parity. That means the number of bits here that have the value 1 has to be an odd number. So for example, if you had 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, so we have 8 ones, 8 bits that have the value 1. It says here, the parity says that they have to be odd. Well then, an extra bit must be added, either a 0 or a 1. So obviously, in order to make this an odd, this is already even, that the user data has even number. So we better add another 1 to make it odd. And let's say, for example, if the user has one, 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 and the rest of them are zeros, the other eight, you know, the, the eight bits, the three of them are ones. So we have to add another bit, the parity bit. And we need to keep the whole lot, including the parity bit, an odd number. So in this case, we better add a zero, just to keep the entire, the total number to three, which is fine, it's an odd number. This one, nine, that's an odd number, and so on. So that's what the last bit is for. It's called the parity bit. So if for some reason, if this bit flipped to a zero by mistake or by long time or whatever it is, by an external magnetic, so when we are reading it the next time, the operating system will read this and first it checks and say how many bits that have the value one, one, two. Ah, hold on, two. They should be odd. Then there's something wrong. This is one of the bits that have gone. So that's one way of checking errors, either during storage or during moving from one hard disk to another, from tape to a, from one um, storage media to another. So this is, this is known as the parity bit uh, error detection, and that's it's just one extra track, one ninth track on the tape. For every byte stored, an extra bit is added, either as a zero or as a one, to keep the number of one, the bits that have the value one to keep it odd or even as whatever the agreement is uh, that was selected. So tapes, in tapes information is stored in those tracks and each track is, for example, usually you write a group of them, group of bits, and it's, this is known as a record on a tape. 
or for example, if you're storing students' information, each student group of information about one student who's known as a record. And as you're reading, you need to show or identify where's the end of one record and the start of the next record. And on a tape, they usually have some space on the tape with nothing on it, and then the next record is a good distance away from that record. So here's a record, and here's a record. And what's between them, they call it the, a, a record gap or inter-record gap. So the entire tape is just full of record space, record space, record space, for, to identify. So when, when, when information is being read, we know where's the start of one record, where's the end of it, <clears throat> where the next record is, and then, and if you read a number of records and stop at this point, and then you want to read the next record, if the tape goes stationary, and then you want to read the next record, you must get the tape r reaching a certain speed before you can actually read from it. So that's a good gap, a good space to give the tape that time to reach a, a minimum speed that a record can be read. Remember, there's a head sitting here that picks up that information. So it has to be going at a, a specific speed before it can read it. And that gap can provide that. But as you can see, that gap is huge. It's, it's much longer than a record. And, and it reduces the efficiency of the storage capacity of the, of the tape. So what they started doing instead, they said, no, let's get a group of records together. Here's another record. Here's another record and record, so we get few records, 10, 15, a number, specific number of records, and they called, and then we have one gap, and then another group of records, and each group of records, they call it a block. So a block is a number of records, and between each block and a block, now instead of an inter-record gap, they have an inter-block gap. So on tapes, you read a group of records, and then you take a gap, and then another group of records. So anytime you read from a tape, again, this is kind of the equivalent of a sector or a block on the hard disk. You read a group of records, put them into memory. If your application wants only one, here's the one. If you want the second one, it's already there in memory. We don't have to go back to the tape. So mostly now here we're interested in hard disks. So which one is better? Just a quick question. The hard disk or a tape? What do you think? A tape? It depends. Yeah, very good. Give me one reason why you say, hey, tapes are better in this case. When would you go for a tape? If you have a backup, if your applications do not have interactiveness with the user, then yeah, if you don't need a quick response, yeah, go for tapes. Why would you go for tapes? Because they are cheaper and they can store a lot more data. So far anyway. And you'd go for hard disks if you have interactive uh, operations, like people going to a bank to lodge money and do their transactions. They want immediate action, they want quick response. You can't have a tape. In the old days, 50 years ago, ah, 40 years ago, we used to have tapes. And you don't do your transactions directly. You do it and they keep a record of it and they, they store it and then at the end of the day they start, they, they do a batch operation. They go through all the transactions of the day, they update the main files. But now files are updated immediately. Every transaction you do goes to your main file. That can only be done if we have direct access to those files. <clears throat> so, Hard disks are obviously very important. And they are important because, because of the response time, because of the interactiveness that they provide. They're still relatively slow 
and primitive compared to the CPU, but that's the best we have at the moment. So, um, <clears throat> so we try and the operating system tries to improve the performance of hard disks. So, and that's what we look at now, the strategies of improving performance of, of multiple requests that come into a hard disk. So what's the best way to, to, to improve it? So let's have an example first and, and, and we'll work on it. So remember, on a hard disk, um, as I said earlier on, the, the tracks are numbered from 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to whatever, track number 800 or 1,000 or whatever the, the maximum number. That depends on, on the hard disk and on the quality and cost and storage capacity and all that. But we have a minimum starting zero on the outside and working in towards the center. And remember that each item stored on a hard disk is determined, its location is determined by the track that it falls on and the sector it's on. Also, there is another aspect of hard disks. Now, again, if we rotate this hard disk and look at it, um, cross-sectionally, you, you'll see a hard disk something like that. And, and the surface of the hard disk is the part that's impregnated with the magnetized material that, or material that can be magnetized. And that's the one that we can write on onto. And usually the head, you could see the head something like this on top of the hard disk that we can move it in or out or, or to just say if you're looking at the head here, that could be the head that can move onto the correct track until... So that's what it might look like. And in most hard disks, you can actually write on both sides of that disk. So you can actually have tracks on the top surface and on the bottom surface of that disk. And on most of them, so even though, for example, it, it rotates around that, it's actually they have a second, or maybe sometimes more than a second, a few disks that are fitted onto the same component, and they call this a disk pack. So you can have a pack of disks uh, on the same hard disk, on the same, in the same housing. And in fact, you'll have the, the head that goes in there, you have two heads, one reading there, on that surface, and one reading from the lower, sur the surface of the next disk. And also on both sides, so you can actually do the same thing here. And if there's even another one. And they all rotate together. And the heads here, sometimes they don't use the bottom, the last, the, uh, the outside, you know, the very top surface and the very bottom surface. In some hard disks, they don't use them for storage, but on others, they do. So they're all connected together, or they should be connected together. And they all have the same mechanism. But once you push them in, all the heads go on together. You pull them out, and they all move out together, all the heads. So if this head is on track number 10, so is this one on this surface. It's on track number 10, and so is this one. And once they're all, all the heads are on the same track, whatever track it is, and that track, they call it a cylinder. So a cylinder is on, a, on, on one of those packs, on a hard disk pack where there's more than one disk or one surface for storage, a cylinder is all the tracks that share the same number. Wherever that head is on at that moment of time, then all the tracks. And what's, what's so special about a cylinder? Right, so what? Track number seven here, same as we are reading from track 777. Imagine if we have a, a big hard disk on one surface. No, a big file, sorry, on, a, on the same surface. Let's say most of the time allocation of space is random. You don't always get the same space continuous on the same hard disk for a file. Sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't, not necessarily. So if you have a very large file like this, it could be on the same track. But more likely than not, you're going to have 
you ask for a space, you're going to open a new file, you're given this block. And you start writing. This block fills up. You say, I need to write another, you know, more space. They give you another block. It could be here. The operating system will link that to that. It knows it's, that belongs to the same file. And then you need another block, and it could be here somewhere. And another block. So the same file could be made up of so many different blocks in different areas of the hard disk. So if you are reading this file, you'll have to move the head in, read that block, copy it, and then you, you want to read the other block. So you have to move, there's block number one, block number two, so you have to move it out to this track. So you keep moving the head. That movement of the head is known as seek time. You're actually doing a lot of seek time wasting. Imagine if you had a cylinder, and if you had this block here on cylinder, say, I don't know, 22. Also, this block, instead of putting it there, let's put it onto this surface here on the same cylinder, 22. So you can fill this cylinder and then go to the same cylinder. So the same file can be read, doesn't matter how big it is, by just placing the head in one location. And you can read it on different pallets or um, surfaces of the same hard disk without actually any further movement of the of the disks or of the heads. And that kind of tends to improve performance. So in a way, it's important. The cylinder is, is, is an important part. You know, it's, even though it's conceptual, there's no such thing as a cylinder. But all the tracks that form the same number, they're known as the cylinder with that number. So even sometimes some books define it. They say, what's track 50? Oh, sorry, what's cylinder 50? It says all, this, all the tracks on the disk pack that have number 50, they form cylinder number 50. <clears throat> right, so that's another point I wasn't. So let me get back now to the strategies of selecting, you know, which requests we should go for so let's say we have a hard disk. Again, looking at the surface, just one surface of that hard disk. This is track 0, track 1, 10, 20, 30, 40, and so on. 60, 100, 200, and so on. This is a big hard disk, so the center is here somewhere. But let's say track 400 somewhere here, or track 200 somewhere in the middle. 300 is here. It's just an example, so don't worry about too much of it. And let's say that we have a number of processes, many processes executing, running. And every process has few files open. And the processes, uh, every now and again, say, read from that file or write to that file. So we have few requests. So let's say we have a request to read from location 50, track number 50. And we also have a track number, another request to, to read from track number 200 or 300, which is this one here, and then another seven, track number 70, track number 10, and track number, I don't know, 250. So these are the requests. We have few requests to read from those tracks. Now, let's see how long does it take us to, to perform this as an operating system. How long will it take the operating system to perform this? So, first, it depends where our head at the moment, where the last re read or write operation we've done it, and the head is stuck there. So let's say the head is at location number 100. Let's say the last read operation we've done at this head. And we're going to say every time you move the head from off one track to the next track, it's going to take, let's say, a thousandth of a second or a hundredth of a second or a unit time, whatever it is. So if we have the move to move the, the head across 10 tracks, then it's going to take us 10 hundredths of a second. So we unit time. Let's say whatever the unit time is, each time you move it across one track, it's going to cost you one unit time, one thousandth of a second. So let's work out in total how long, how many tracks do we have to move around, and that's the length of time that we can transfer that or translate that into time. So our head at the moment is 
right, sit on top of track number 100. So this is time-wise. So the first thing we need to go to is track number 50. So as time goes, we're going to be moving the head to this location, track 50. How long will it take us? Well, it depends how many tracks we crossed. We went from track number 100 to track number 50. That's a total of 50 tracks or 50 thousandths of a second or 50 hundredths of a second. Okay? Is that okay? And then the next thing we need to go to, track 300. So it'll take us a bit of time to get there, but we move the head. This is how fast it'll go. But I don't know how long is that. That's, let's say, it's going to be 250. We went from track 50 to track 300. That's a total of 250 tracks, or 250 thousandths of a second. And then we went down to 70, which is somewhere along here somewhere. So from 300 to 70, so from 300 down to 70, that's a total of 230 tracks, right? I, check me out, sometimes I might make the wrong calculation here. But. And then from 70, we go to track 10. So it's track 10 is somewhere down there. So from 70 to 10, that's about 60 milliseconds. Or, and then we go to 250, so from 10, to 250 somewhere here, that's a total of 240 thousands of a second or millions of a second. So we finished. We finished one, two, three, four, five requests, and we've done them as they came. So this is known as first come, first served. So this is the strategy of first come, first served. Usually, if you like first in, first out, it's always the easiest to implement. But let's see how much our total space or total time taken. So we can add 50 and 250 to 300, 5, 530, 590, 790, and 830 in total, right? Maybe I could be wrong. 0, 0, 0, 0, 5, 5, 10, 19, 23, and 2 is 4, 6, 8. Yeah. So 830 milliseconds or thousands of a second, whatever the, the number is. And that's the total. That's good. We can also work out the average divided by five and it'll give, you, it'll give us an average turnaround or you know, performance, access time. So this is total access time for five processes for those requests. It sounds okay. Maybe there's still less than a second or a couple of seconds. Um, or maybe eight seconds. It depends on what this time unit is. Let's now try something else. Try another strategy. And the other strategy is, I'm going to have the, exactly the same thing starting from zero, and we need the 10 or 50, 100, 200, 3, 400. And, <clears throat> right, so the other one is the shortest seek time first. Shortest seek time first. If you remember when we did processes that like that's the shortest CPU, maybe, uh, per, maybe yeah, or shortest process first. But this one here, this is the shortest seek time. Again, where were we? Where did we start from? Where we started? The head was one, one right here at this location. So we have exactly almost the same environment. And we all, we have the same requests at the same hard disk with the initial location of the head is at the same point. We just change the strategy and see which one will give us better performance. So let's try the shortest seek time first. So wherever you are at 100, look, select the one that the head will have to make the shortest movement from its present location. So in this case here, if we move it to 250, it'll have to move 100, across 150 tracks. If we move it to this one, it'll have to move across 90 tracks. Remember, it's at 100. This seems to be the shortest, right? So go from 100 to 70. So from 100 went to 70, and that will take about 30 milliseconds, or whatever the, our time unit is. So that's done. So the next thing, from 70, the head is now here at 70. Where is the shortest distance? 
it can go to 10 or 50. 50 is the shortest, so it can go to 50, and that's from 70 to 50, and it'll go across 20 tracks. And then from 50, so that's done as well. 10, 10 is probably the next shortest thing. So here's 10, so from 50 to 10, that's across 40 tracks. So we're at 10, we have only two to go to either 250 or 300. So let's go to obviously 250. So from location 10 to location 250 or track 250, that's 240 tracks. And then the last one is 300. So that goes from 250 to 300. And that's a total of 50 tracks. So let's get the sum, we're finished. So let's get the sum of all the tracks and that's the, the, the length of time it takes us to do those. So that's 50, 100, 340, 380, a total of 380 unit time as opposed to 830. We have a saving of more than 50% of reduce the time that it takes. So with a bit of management, with changing the policy from the first come first serve to the shortest seek time first, we are able to reduce the amount of work tremendously. We've improved performance. We can improve the performance of a hard disk by actually just changing the order of the requests that we have to read or write from or to a hard disk. So there is a, a definite advantage. Is there any disadvantage? Can anybody see any disadvantage to the shortest seek time first? I can't see that. What? The, are... the processes are what? Whatever the reading, reading file is out of order. After reading the file is out of order. Uh, out of order. Mm, th these are the requests to do. Say we have 10 requests and they're all available to you now and you can just put them in, in any particular order. Uh, okay, it might be a little bit out of order, maybe we, we, we run, but we, we are assuming that these arrive together or they're all available to us, to a function that selects which one. So, no, okay, this one they just reads one block. Remember, any read or write operation is going to be one block. If we have to come back and read another block, there will be another request. I might we get another request later, but there'd be a lot of requests coming to the hard disk. Just, and sometimes they're dynamic. They're not all available and here, sort them out. Uh, so they keep coming up while the head is moving and while a read operation is performed. All right, so one of the disadvantages of the shortly seek time first is that you, you tend to have a localized kind of it, localized effect. So it tends to serve wherever it happens to be. So if there are lots of requests here, then you're going to delay the ones on the other side. So it favors the local. Wherever the hard disk, wherever, wherever the head is, all the local ones, they'll get priority kind of thing. And you might end up, so if we keep getting requests coming in dynamically, more requests arriving while you are in this area, then more requests for 120, 50, 75, and all that, then this will get delayed, 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 delayed. Anybody knows what we call that when you keep delaying a process from getting its resource? Starvation, you could end up starving one of the processes or delaying it for a long time. It's a, there is no guarantee that you're going to get your turn. And also, they call this a variance. You, you, you don't know. Sometimes you go in and you get very good service very quick, and sometimes you get a very long time. So the variance in service is, is too long, and that's not a recommended thing in a system, to have a large variance. It, it, it will be good to, to, to have some sort of confidence in a system. You say, I'll be served. All right, I might get delayed a tiny bit, but not you know, by huge amounts. So, even though it gives an overall good performance, but it might kind of 
take sides against certain, you know, processes just because the head happens to be in a certain area. And if the head moves that way, then it will start favoring the other ones that are at the higher tracks. There's, so there's another policy or another strategy that they use, and, and it's called the SCAN. The SCAN policy, it tends to remove this kind of favoritism or favoring the, lo the local ones. The scan one just says, I'm going to just wipe this out or maybe put it under a different color. The scan kind of says, listen guys, we're going to be from this point going all the way to the, to the maximum and come back all the way to the minimum. And the head just keep moving like that. Goes all the way to track zero, all the way to the maximum and keeps moving around and servicing each request it finds along its way. And that seems to give you at least a guarantee that you're not going to be left for a very, very long time because you're going to, you know, the head is moving, scanning all the time, moving left and right, servicing any requests that happen to arrive at the time. Um, that removes this localization issue and that kind of um, starvation. Okay, so that's, and the head is kind of going into this continuous move. It doesn't kind of jerk up and down, left, and so you just keep going from one side to the other side. It stops only, you know, when it gets the track and when it reaches the end. And that seems to be also a good, a good strategy. Anybody can suss out any problems? Can you see any issues with this? Ah, oh, well, I'd imagine if there are no requests, it'll probably stop. So, but as long as there are requests, of course, you, you, you don't want to stop it. You want to keep going. So that goes the same with, with all of them. Yeah, anybody else? Can anybody spot any issue with this? It's great. We don't want to give... Priorities, you know, so there's no favoring, it's more fair. Is that what you're trying to say or is it not fair? It's going across. Why not? It's going across from one end to the other. Anybody who's here will serve you. And then we'll come back again, we'll serve everybody all the way. So it doesn't stay in one area, leaving the other area unserved for a very long time. So it tends to be slightly better. Yeah? even though there's nobody at the other end. Okay, or maybe there's only one. Yeah, but, okay, okay. Um, but that's okay. They're not gonna be waiting for a very long time. They're gonna get their turn. So, okay, but you have a point there. I'll get to it, yeah? Is it overall? Oh, yeah, I'd, I'd imagine it'll be, there's nothing faster normally than the shortest seek time first. Uh, but shorter seek time, it may be fast overall, it gives you better performance, but if you are sitting at the other end, it's not good news for you. You know, it doesn't matter how good the system is, if you, if you as an individual process request sitting there, not getting there, and, and each time you say, right, there are five or ten requests here, as soon as the eighth or ninth one is served, you say, I'm going to get my turn next, suddenly few more requests arrive here and you're left waiting for a much longer time. So it, it eliminates that issue. Okay, anybody else want to try something here? This one, the, 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 the scan seems to have at least two problems. One of them is that you might actually have a request here and there to deal with, but there's no more. And you might get one request here, no, but there's no more requests. But you're going there, and from this point onward, there's no more, no more requests, but you're still going there all the way to the end, wasting time. And instead of maybe reversing here at this point. So that's, that's no requests, but you still have to go to the edge. Maybe. So that's, that's, that's a bit of a waste. The other thing is that, yeah, even though you don't get starved, but still there's no equality in who, like, 
requests that arrive later sometimes get served first before, before you. Let's say, for example, let's say you're sitting here, right? And the head just came and passed. You just missed the head where your request arrived. Like, uh, there's a request at this point here. Just missed the head. The head is just moving in this direction. And it served this one, served this one. Now you're waiting. Now you're waiting for quite a long time. And it served all those. It's coming back. And you're still waiting. And a, a request just arrived now. Just there. In front of the head. It gets served. Even though it just arrived now, and you've been sitting there for quite a good you know, time at this stage, Another request comes, will the, all later requests will, will be served before this request has been waiting for a while. Until now, it will get its turn now. But until it got its turn, there are many other requests that have arrived that got ahead of it, which doesn't seem to be very fair. Okay, you're not going to be starved for a long time, but still there are few requests that are, arrive later that are going to be served before you. So you kind of you're missing your turn still. Well, not missing your turn, but the later ones. So they improve that in two aspects. They improved it, they improved the scan. They say, let's have a circular scan. What's a circular scan? It's a scan that will serve requests in one direction, but once it gets there, it doesn't serve any of these that arrive late. It, you know, it'll, it'll just go back quick to this point, no servicing, and only services in one direction. And then flies here and then services in one direction. That reduces a little bit the effect of late arrivals and the much delay that a process may suffer due to many new arrivals that could take your time, as the new arrivals arrive here, and if you just missed it, they'll be serving the ones that have just arrived, you've been sitting there, so none will be served along this way. They, they, all these, they'll be taken to notice and they'll be served in the way back. So it only provides service in one direction. So that's one improvement. The other improvement is, is known as the look. So that's another strategy called, called look. And look is look ahead. Is there a point of carry on or not? Let's say, here's an example. Remember earlier on he said, let's say there's a request there, but there's no more requests all the way to the end to the maximum track until you come back and there are a few more requests here. So the look, each time it stops and serves a request, it looks between here and the end there. Are there any more requests scheduled? Yes, let's go and then it gets to this one, it serves this one. And when it serves, it says, are there any more requests between here and the end? And there aren't. Well then, there's no point of going there, let's turn back now. So it turns back and starts servicing requests already there. And each now service, each request, it serves here, so it looks and say, is there any request scheduled for me between here and zero, track zero? And if there are not, well, there's no point of going there. Turn back and start servicing more requests. So when it gets near the end, it doesn't have to reach to the end if there's nobody, if there's no need to do any work out there. If there's no request, you don't have to go all the way to the end just for the sake of it. So that's the scan. It goes all the way to the end. But the look, it always involves look ahead. Before I go, is there any request that needs to be served on that end? And if there is, it'll, it'll go. So these are the scans that we'll probably do the, the slides tomorrow. Have we signed the attendance sheet? No? Yes? No? Do, what time do we finish? Oh, right now then. Okay, so maybe we should speed things up. Any questions, guys? No questions. Great. I'll ask a couple of questions. What's a cylinder? It's the same track on different surfaces. On different surfaces, yeah. Um, 
And what is, what's, what's a track? What are tracks? Yeah, concentric circles. Are they just one continuous circle or? Yeah, one circle inside the other. And what are they used for? Yeah, that's where information is stored is along those tracks. And what's a block or, or, or a sector? Anybody? A group of Sorry? A group of tracks. A group of tracks? No, a part of a track. Okay, sorry, one at a time. Uh, on a tape, it's a group of records. Say again? On a tape, a block is a group of records. No, 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 I'm talking about, oh, here, yeah, no. Let's, let's stick to hard disks. Uh, it's a part of a, a track, in a segment. Yeah, a, a track is divided into equal size sectors, sometimes known as blocks. Okay, um, and that's, and it's also the, normally the unit that the operating system uses to read or write from or to hard disk. What's the DS, um, DASD? What does it stand for? Direct access storage, Direct access storage device. And which one is better? A hard disk or a CD or an optical disk? Which one is faster at reading and writing? An optical disk or a hard disk? An optical disk, it's not dependent on the head. Uh, hey, any, any answers? Any other answer? Hard disk is faster. It has what? Fixed head. Oh, the fixed head. Yeah, definitely. The fixed head is is faster than the very the moving head or um, movable heads. But just considering movable heads on hard disks or CDs and DVDs or optical disk drives. They, they tend to, hard disks tend to be faster uh, up to this stage. They, they, you can store more information on the same size CD or DVD on, on track, per track. Um, come on, guys, I think we'll, we'll leave. Thank you. I, w I was just waiting for the attendance sheet to be signed. Where is that sheet? Where is that attendance sheet?